anyway, I'm going to pray for us. Um, Jesus, thank you for this time that we can come together and talk about you and be in your presence. Um, I pray that all the worries and yeah, that, that, that all that stuff would just kind of float away um, and that we would just, that the veil would be thin between us and you and we would feel you tonight and that you would give us good things. Pray this in your name. Amen. Um, so let's see. Okay. Um, Caleb talked about, introduced last week that um, for the next handful of weeks, we're going to be talking about hope. Um, because we can all use more of that right now, right? Um, because it's COVID and it's winter and all the things. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about the hope that's available to us through Jesus's resurrection and the promise of heaven. Um, and sadly, I feel like Christians are really good at making this hopeful topic sound not at all hopeful. Um, case in point, when I was a senior in high school, in the throes of being an excited new Christian, um, I was standing in the parking lot with my best friend, Ari, um, and randomly he asked me what I thought, he was, he's Jewish, um, he randomly out of the blue asked me what I thought was going to happen to him when he died. Um, and not wanting to lie about my newly obtained understanding of the bridge diagram. Um, I don't know if any of you guys remember that. Um, yeah, my understanding of Christianity through the bridge diagram. I said something along the lines of, well, if you don't believe in Jesus, I think you're going to hell. Like, I probably even phrased it that way because it felt so painful to say. Um, but I was that person that said that to him. Um, the next day, he totally made fun of me um, in front of all our, our friends, which I think he should have. Um, and it was embarrassing. And it actually continues to make me sad to this day. Like, I actually think about that moment. Um, I've thought about it a handful of times over the past 20 years um, because I think I actually hurt him. And I gave him a messed up view of Jesus. Um, and I put a wedge in our relationship. Like, I think after that, uh, I'm, I think that he kind of was always wondering if I was like judging him. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't believe in hell or grapple deeply with what that means, but the picture is super complicated. Um, and there's lots of room for different interpretations. Um, but more important than all of that is that the story of the gospel, it's not about hell. It's about what God wants for us, right? Um, that he wants us to exist in his love and that he wants us to know him. Um, and I didn't leave my friend Ari with any feeling of Jesus's love and what Jesus's death actually meant for humanity. Um, I turned this like really hopeful message into a weird judgmental exclusionary statement. Um, when what God more than anything wants is to include people. Um, and isn't it easy to kind of feel uh, that that other, that other way about the gospel message sometimes, right? Like we trudge through life and we experience pain, and disappointment, and grief. And then at the end, uh, we're met by God who can't stand our brokenness. Um, but if we believe in Jesus, then we get in. And we proceed to sit on a cloud and play a harp with our ghosty spirit hands um, for all eternity, worshiping God forever and ever and ever. That doesn't sound that great to me, right? Like that sounds, that gives me aches just thinking about that kind of life for eternity. Um, so my hope is that we can steep our sad winter bodies into a true, in a truer version of God's plan for us and for creation and for death um, or for creation and then after death and then hopefully we'll actually see that there's good news for us um, in, in God's plan. Um, so there's a lot of verses that uh, that we could talk about tonight um, that talk about a lot about um what god wants to do with creation and with our bodies uh but i had to pick one 
And so for folks online, I think you have access to it, right? On the website. Did you put it on the website? Okay. Um, first Corinthians 15, 20. Uh, well, and then it keeps going. I cut out some chunks because it was just very, very long. Um, so if you were curious about what I cut out, feel free to take a peek at that. Um, but we won't probably talk about that tonight. So I'm going to give us a few minutes to read it. Um, and then we'll talk about it. Uh oh. Also, think about any questions that you have too. Are most folks done? <laughs> cool. I'm going to read it really fast because some of us are auditory. Um, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. <laughs> what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. God gives it a body as he is determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. The splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars and star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. 
I'm going to stop there because I'm going to break it up into chunks. And I want to talk about this first chunk first. Um, so what we probably won't get to all of the questions because I have a lot that I, want to, I have questions I want us to talk about. But uh, that being said, what are some of your questions or, or observations if you have any? Um, it's a, well, maybe this felt easy for you. Sometimes Paul's kind of hard for me to, to pay attention to. <laughs> um, but question. I think it's, yeah. Um, it's, I think it's interesting that he says that for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. It doesn't seem selective, you know? Hmm. I like that speaking of the Adam, uh, thing, it's kind of, he's kind of um, helping us remember the creation story, which I think is interesting. Um, when, God, when God created the Garden of Eden and created Adam and everything was perfect and Adam got to name all the animals. Um, anyway, we can keep that in our Yeah, there's head. a longer one where he's like, if uh, through Adam the power of death came to all people living in how much more can the power of life come to people through the one man, Jesus? Is that in Romans he talks, or something? He talks about the whole, like, like Adam died eating at a tree and Jesus oh, died yeah. life at a tree. Uh, the whole like, Yeah, Paul's always kind of bringing the whole narrative together, which I think is really interesting. He that, always wants to, to remember what God's original intention was and how it got messed up. Sorry? Macro man. Macro man, Paul. <laughs> but what spoke okay, about other it? Other questions, me, observations. Sorry, go. But what what spoke about it to me though is that he says like all died in Adam and all will be made alive in Christ. Like, seems like he's saying all people. Yeah. This yeah. Is one, yeah it's probably one of the versions that um, everybody makes their way eventually. Uh, theory gets built around. Mm -hmm. I'm confused why asking how are the dead raised, what, with what kind of body will they come, is a foolish question. Does that <laughs> seem, does it seem foolish to me? Wait, 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 where is that one at? Uh, yeah, he's like, six. how foolish. Yeah. I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like if I was talking to Paul, he'd just kind of be like, dude, you just don't get it. And I'd be like, I, I don't get it, actually. <laughs> I think also, um, I remember reading that um, Paul was also combating a particular uh, spirituality that was popular, which was um, more uh, like the Gnostics who thought that the body was bad. And so um, the, at the end, mm -hmm. your spirit is released from the, the horrible body. Uh, and, and it's just ridiculous. Like, we have to remember that we've never seen anybody get raised from the dead other than a few people that saw Jesus's body. So it is just, I mean, that is why, yeah, it's not that foolish. Of course, people are going to be curious about that. But um, anyway, yeah, he spent so much time talking about the body because there's these people that don't think that the body is going to get resurrected. Anyway. Anything else? Questions? Observations? It seems like usually analogies kind of follow what they're comparing against. But in this scenario, I mean, usually when you sow something, it doesn't die. Live, but that analogy is confusing. Mm. I would call it foolish as well. Like, if you're going to tell me the corn seed I just planted dies and then grows out of the ground like I don't think so it's a life that's out of it. Yeah. I think he's just saying like in the same way that we bury a body and life comes out of the the thing that we put in the ground. I think he's talking about well, like planting people in the ground. Or or no well seeds seeds come from things that die, right? Does it isn't that how it works? Like like the plant has to kind of die no. like no not the plant <laughs> but like the leaves 
Oh yeah. The flower okay. dies. Sorry. <laughs> the flower dies. No. Nah. You just learned it. <laughs> no. Well, when you. But I was just thinking about the fall and how the leaves like come off, and with corn, the corn, the corn like basically kind of rots, and that's this. Isn't the corn the seed? What it? I mean, even if it doesn't die, like it's kind of separating from the plant in some way, which you could say is similar, maybe. Yeah, but you're right. Okay, it's a little weird, a little bit weird of an analogy. <laughs> I the guess flower does maybe. die, though. Yeah. Plant will grow, yeah, that's what Eduardo was saying too. The plant, the plant will grow a flower, and then the flower gets fertilized, and then the flower dies and creates the seed, which is whatever you know. There's a child running out. Biology. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or you usually like to get the to get the corn, you have to bury the seed to protect it from the elements. So there is some aspect of burying, but yeah, you're, yeah. Anyway, weird analogy. Who knows about that? Um other questions or observations? <laughs> now that I showed my lame understanding of well, I think, I think <laughs> I think the analogy makes sense to me because it's like the the analogy is that you put something in the ground and it comes out different. So in that way, humans and seeds are alive. I liked that middle section just where Paul talks about like kind of all the different variations of what can be beautiful. And like, I don't know, just kind of gives us a reminder that like what we think of as like our hope or what we think of as our possibilities or even what beauty can mean for us when we die like it's just so beyond what we could think of like it's kind of exciting and like refreshing to think like oh yeah like god's so creative like why do we kind of put limits on you know what he could do even in the afterlife like with how we yeah. think about it that's good i also like that he talked about um that the bod this earthly body is also has splendor so it's like both the heavenly body is has splendor and the earthly body i i just appreciate that 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 god loves both <laughs> yeah yeah i was thinking the same thing like i really appreciated how he didn't say like there's this kind of glory on earth and then just wait the glory is going to be even better in this heavenly body like he was just there's glory here and there's glory there and i just yeah i appreciate that a lot totally i'm gonna get the passage because it's hard to see it on this computer um any other questions or oh caleb's getting for me observations before we plunge in i think it's interesting as well if we're considering that there was kind of like a gnostic gospel going around just that material is bad but yeah I feel like that's kind of been reborn through like the word of faith movement of just like material is bad like speak out what is eternal and good and i think uh, like sarah was saying i appreciate that no there there's almost beauty in like the brokenness of our humanity as well um mm -hmm. and that there is things that will be redeemed but that material is not inherently evil or sinful yes yeah totally god like loves us <laughs> god loves his creation he loves what he made um yeah okay so he sp so paul spends a decent amount of time talking about this resurrected body um because clearly ha people have not seen a dead person come back to life i mean there's a few that have seen jesus but that's what just handfuls um and it's hard to believe. Uh, so, okay, so Paul emphasizes that what we become in heaven is bodily. He talks about the resurrected Jesus. He says that we, ra we rise as heavenly bodies. Um, why would he use that word? Like, why is it so important to Paul that Jesus's body is resurrected and that our bodies, though they're transformed, they're still, they're, our bodies are resurrected? Why do you think that that's important? Rather than just um, a disembodied spirit. Well, 
Like you said, with that touch of flavor. <laughs> Did um, you guys hear that? <clears throat> Life would suck without touch and flavor. That is true. I, I also think like the whole like disembodied thing is just like something that people came up with in the 18th century. Like, I don't think Paul could have even conceived of you being you without a body. There's actually like, tons well, of. Um, I don't even know if I can conceive of me. Being I had to. No, no, no. I had to. Re, I had to write a paper one time on the continuity and discontinuity of the resurrected body. And um, there's tons of writing out there that's all about how um, actually, like, who we are has to do with our body, like, just the way. Like, it's not. We're not. Yeah, it's like, not a soul. There's no such thing as a soul. It. It's like our body working complicatedly together <laughs> yeah. so our body is important to our experience and who we are it's our body is actually like part of our identity um and uh, yeah anyway interesting so like if our body is not risen then what is that is that even us do you know what i mean because who are we without like our body <laughs> does that make sense a little bit <laughs> Anyway, um, other thoughts about why it's so important that it's a body that's raised and not just a spirit. It's who we are. Um, what else? What does it say about God? I have so many more to go at a good time. <laughs> I mean, like you said, like he delights in his creation and the diversity and beauty of it and so i could i mean it would only make sense for that to also be in heaven or like in the new earth or whatever totally, totally. <laughs> that was weird because i heard myself i heard feedback um <clears throat> yeah like god god loves his creation well he doesn't want to abandon it right um yeah he jesus <clears throat> had to actually like if jesus um was just some non-bodily thing when he rose up then actual death and destruction and the brokenness of the world would not be defeated does that make sense like if our bodies do not rise then the death is still real does that make sense? Like death and, but God, Jesus on the cross, when he rose up, he actually defeated death. And so therefore like our bodies have to come up. Does that make sense? Um, and what that communicates is that one, God defeated death, but it's, he did not want to abandon creation. He did not want to abandon this like beautiful, good thing that he made. He wanted to free it from decay and the death and the destruction and the brokenness and the sin of this world, right? Um, yeah, he wants to set us free um, from all the crap that we deal with here because he loves us and he wants to make us new. That's good news. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about what this new body is, like what kind of observations we can make about it. Um, and Side note, verse 44, when it talks about the natural body and the spiritual body, um, it's actually not a great translation. Uh, what, what Paul is more accurate translation with the Greek is that he's not talking about actual flesh, like a, nat a physical fleshy body and a spiritual body. He's talking about the energy that animates the new body. So basically he's saying um, that the humanly body is animated by our own, like, our, our self and this this new heavenly body is going to be animated by the breath of God, God's pneuma. Anyway, side note. Um, okay, so tell me, what do you notice about these new bodies? What strikes you about them? particularly verses 35 through 44. And there's, there's a litany uh, from 42 through 44, which contrasts between 
I mean, I'm kind of imagining in my head, like, you know, Paul watching a funeral and commenting on the body that is sown, it's perished, it's dishonored, and it's weak. And then thinking towards our bodies that will be as imperishable, glorious, and powerful, and animated by, by, by the breath of God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's kind of a it's kind of a crazy contrast yeah it is a very crazy contrast <laughs> that is true those things, yeah, those things sound good. what yeah those things sound good what okay what so it's uh where was it raised in glory raised in power um raised in uh spiritual body animated by the, <laughs> by the breath of god like why why is that good news <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if this means it's the uh, six packs are involved, but like it seems like <laughs> it seems like um, the innate potential that was in everybody is like fully like because the seed analogy. Like you, you don't look at a seed, and if if you've never seen a plant before, you wouldn't look at a seed and be like, "Oh yeah, that's got all this potential in it." But then when it becomes a massive plant, it's like there, the DNA is possible. There's a DNA in there that was possible of reproducing something much bigger than what it was before. And like, like who we will be, we don't yet know. And like, what our bodies are, are gonna be capable of are way beyond. I like, I do like thinking that the seed of this beautiful, glorious future body is within me right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, that feels hopeful to me. Like, <laughs> like the seed is there. <laughs> there's, <laughs> yeah, there's this like continuity. Like once again, it will be me. It will just be so much better. <laughs> why, why is that good news? Yeah, it's like, um, it's, it's like we are all seeds and all we've ever seen is seeds. And a seed is just like a small thing. It's like pretty boring, like maybe good for a snack. And then, but like, it could turn into like a redwood tree or something. It's like, it's incomprehensible how different and much more amazing what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? I don't know about you guys. Well, you guys, not everybody likes running as much as me, but I am like looking forward to the day when I can run a hundred miles and get all of the runner's high and the awesomeness of it without experiencing the pain and the fatigue, right? Um, I'm looking forward to the day when I don't have my, my pinched nerve that like makes my whole arm numb certain times. Um, like, our anxiety is going to be gone, our panic attacks, our diabetes, our arthritis, our legs that don't always work right, our fear is going to be gone. We're not have to worry, we're not going to have to worry about catching COVID or cancer, right? Like we'll get to hang out with each other with our amazing bodies. <laughs> we get to party all night long, which uh, some I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm sure that sounds not like heaven to some introverts, but my bodies aren't going to get tired, right? Like that's like, that's really good news for people that struggle with chronic pain. Like you're not going to have to experience that, right? Someone whose body doesn't work right. Like it's going to work right in heaven. Um, I won't struggle with self-hatred be anymore because I will fully see that my body is glorious. Right? That's good news. Um, and the exciting thing, okay, that's really good. I want all of that, but there's even more. Um, I'm going to jump to another passage just really quickly. I think we can get it from here, but we can get it even better from another one, which is Romans 8, 19, which tells us, it, uh, I think it might be Romans 8, 19 through 20. I can't remember, but I'm going to read the passage. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. And hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There's no indication that the, the, the present creation is transient right? There's no indication that God is just going to be done, done with earth. So not only 
Is he, does he want to make our bodies good and perfect and transformed and glorious? He wants to do that with earth as well. Um, earth is going to be freed of death and destruction. Um, the world is going to be renewed and animated by the breath of God. N.T. Wright um, likened it to a chalice. <laughs> I don't know. I thought this was funny. He was like, it's like a wine chalice, which is beautiful in its own right. But when it's filled up with wine, it's even better. And that's what earth will be like. It will be filled up with the presence of God. Um, that there will be no more pain and no more destruction and no more melting ice caps and um, disappearing polar bears. Like everything will be filled to the brim with God. Um, and again, looking at Romans, it says the world is waiting with expectation for that moment when the resurrection, life, and power like sweeps through it, right? Um, and if the biblical view of God's future is the renewal of the entire cosmos, if what God wants to do is renew all of us and the entire, like renew our bodies and the entire world, that means that there's actually going to be stuff for us to do. Um, so not only will we be able to enjoy Mount Everest and, with ample amounts of oxygen and enjoy the sun without getting burned, which will be heaven for Caleb. <laughs> um, remember the way that Jesus called his disciples um, to share his work with him? Remember when Paul, Paul talks about Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, um, alluding to when Adam and Eve were called to tend for the garden, right? There will be work for us to do. Like what we know of God is that he always wants to partner with us. That means that there's going to be good work for us to do. So we can forget the clouds and sitting on the clouds and playing a harp, right? Um, there will be work for us to do. And I think we're really going to enjoy it because all of the skills and the talents and the interests and the delightful things that God's given us in this life, they'll be enhanced and we'll be able to exercise them for his glory, right? So Kene will be able to lead people in dance. Uh, Lisette will be able to make beautiful music. Um, Kenan will be able to build beautiful houses, <laughs> if that's like what he likes to do. <laughs> Josh will be able to create awesome movies. Uh, Haley and Sarah will be able to teach people new skills. Uh, Sarah, the therapist. <laughs> I really need to learn your last name. <laughs> um, we'll be able to make people feel even more loved and cared for. Eduardo will be out of a job, probably. Caleb, who knows what Caleb will do. But God will participate and delight in all of it, right? And all the beautiful things about us, all the beautiful skills, and traits that we have will add and add and add to this flourishing and beauty of all of creation. And we'll be doing it in the full presence of the loving God. And if that's what heaven is, that's really hopeful. And I feel like I can get excited about that. So going back to 1 Corinthians, this last part at the end, this is what Paul says. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in, the, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. I like that part. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So this is the opposite of just sit back and relax because we know that God's got a great future for us, right? Um, which I think is sometimes what Christians can do. It's like, why do we care about the earth <laughs> if we're just going to leave it? Which is not what's going to happen. I don't think we're going to leave it. Um, but what is Paul getting at when he says, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because your labor in the Lord is not in vain? What does that mean? Thinking about the fact that we'll have these bodies and this earth aspect, like in heaven. Um, I think for me, what does it mean? Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because your labor is not in vain. Someone's going to say something on the computer. Yeah. This yeah, person in, in person can go. Oh, it's Caleb. No, no, no. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> um, two things. I think, I think it's really comforting because I think as a person who enjoys the product of something, I can often be discouraged in the process of that. And to think that the Lord is um, so engaged in the process that he doesn't want to do away with something that I can often just see as kind of a lost hope. Uh-huh. Um, especially, I think, just living in a really dark city spiritually, just I can lose hope very quickly for the people in my life. And um, so I think changing um, the mindset, like not that I am the savior, but that it's not like the Lord's just going to wipe away and then make something new, but he's yeah. going to renew what is. And how can I be like a partaker of that? Um I think gives me more hope for people that I think are like too far gone or just too lost or too, um, I don't know, hardened. Um, yeah. 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 Like when Jesus came into the world, he didn't distance himself from the people in it. He got all up in it with like, just was always hanging out with people. Um, and that's what Jesus wants for us, right? He doesn't want us to disengage. He wants us to love people around us. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of, what I got out of it was, it's like, whatever we cultivate here on earth, it's like, it's a spiritual thing, right? It's going to be blessed when, even when we get to heaven, too. Yeah. Like, the work you're doing here, you're going to see it in even greater glory in heaven. Because yeah. our spirits aren't going to die. So we're reaching people spiritually and meeting their needs here on earth. It's just going to be like incredible. Yes. And T. Wright actually has a really good quote um, about this. He wrote, every act of love, gratitude, and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a child to read or walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings, and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures. <laughs> so we got to care about the, the dogs and the animals. Uh, and of course, every prayer, every deed that spreads the gospel, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world, all of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. What we do in Jesus and by the Spirit in the present is not wasted. It will last all the way into God's new world. Yeah. I feel like something that needs saying too is like Christians have really botched that message. And uh, like when TV happened, like people, Christians tried to make uh, the, the message as simple as possible. So it's about like what are the minimum entrance requirements to get into heaven? And it was all about, um, are you saved or not saved? And it was all about, like, is your soul going to the right place? And it was based on this 18th century understanding of, like, your soul is different from your body and your body gets thrown away. And so, like, um, it kind of got across this idea to to people that was, like, the only thing that matters is this, like, 30-second decision you make, like, to follow Jesus or not. When, in actuality, like, God's not abandoning any of the projects that are here on earth, like, the ones that are good and creative, like, he loves those, and he wants those to see those go on into eternity. Yeah. And, like, so, yeah, when we fight for justice here, it'll be done. When we fight, when we, like... Can you guys hear this, Caleb online? Okay, good. Yeah, it's, it's just it's just important that it's not, like, abandon the world, start over, yeah. and, because the world sucks, which is which is what I think Christians kind of... For, for about 60 years, that they tried to reduce the gospel to its simplest form in order to make it digestible in a one hour thing on television. So, <laughs> I don't know like, if it's just because of it's TV. Like the, but... Billy Graham was a beautiful man oh, okay. and did great things, but he also wrecked the gospel <laughs> in a way. Like, well, okay, okay. okay. Then, um, or he did it very small. And, and thousands, not just him, there were a lot of people at the time. But, but um, yeah, just like, just seeing this much bigger, much more beautiful vision that God has going rather than just um, like this world sucks and it's going to be abandoned. Yeah. Like, like I think sometimes uh, what we're told is that, you know, we should be in the holy huddles because this world's like dark and bad and we want to save ourselves. Um, But that's the opposite of this picture. (laughs) Yeah. We're not, 
fixing a car that's going to drive off the cliff, right? When we, when we love people in this world, um, when we take part in the ways that Jesus wants us to live. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think um, in yes. just kind of go, going along with that, I think in like Matthew 24, Jesus is telling a parable about, you know, people who presumably have died and they're talking to him like basically like, hey, can I join your presence? And he's like, he's not like, oh, did you say the prayer? He's like, how did you treat the poor? How did you treat the sick? You know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that this that that's important. Um, as we follow Jesus now and love like He tells us to love and live like He tells us to live and care about the things that He cares about, we bring a foretaste of heaven into the here and now. Like we can bring glimpses, fragments of heaven and earth here and now every time we say yes to jesus and do what he wants us to do right like it's um like when jesus came to earth and he said the kingdom of god is near he wasn't talking about like time he was talking about like it's here like it's i'm here um and like i believe that now we have jesus's spirit in inside of us and as we do the things that he tells us to do like we are bringing the kingdom of God, we are bringing glimpses of heaven here and now. Um, and people need that. So, yeah. Because um, right before Jesus left us uh, and went to heaven and gave us his spirit, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, telling them everything that I've told you. So as we follow Jesus and care about the things that he cares about, we're bringing a foretaste to our of heaven, to our friends and our neighbors um, and our family of what God wants to do for the entire cosmos, right? Um, it means that when we protest and speak up against racial injustice, when we choose to advocate for people that are powerless, when we hand out coats to the homeless, when we care about the environment, when we befriend people who are lonely, we're helping bring God's kingdom now and people will see more of who God is and what he cares about, right? Um, the early church cared deeply about racial reconciliation and they were willing to stand up to Caesar and get martyred. Um, they were willing to stay and put when plagues came and devastated Rome, they cared for people because they knew that bodies mattered to God, that the earth mattered to God and that they were partnering with Jesus in restoring it. Um, and we, I think when we start to shift to thinking more about like disembodied souls that like, go to somewhere out there and play harps, um, it's funny that our priorities changed, right? It's not surprising, I think, that when we started living that kind of way that Caleb was talking about, that we be Christianity became less compelling to people. Um, so in the coming weeks, we're going to break some of these elements down um, and try to become people who savor this vision of heaven, um, to become people who are more motivated and more joyful and more loving and more positive because we see a more beautiful horizon, right, with God. Um, but for night, tonight, I just wanted to uh, start painting that larger picture. So we're actually going to have some reflection and prayer, and I'm going to read um, another piece of scripture. Um, and let's ask for the Spirit's presence with us to make this picture vivid. Um, you know that the weather's hard and that the loneliness has been going on for a really long time. And there's what seems like new tragedy that we hear about every day. Um, but we're little seeds that are going to be raised up into these beautiful heavenly <laughs> bodies. And we have this bright future coming. Um, and so as we pray tonight and over these next few months, let's ask the spirit to empower us with hope and make this future feel more vivid. So I'm gonna pray for us and um, throw some reflective time in there. God, thank you for not abandoning us. 
you that you deeply treasure us and this world that you made so much that your end game was always to release us and this world from its bondage to death and decay. And Jesus, we look forward to our healed bodies and we look forward to life with you in a renewed earth and we look forward to the work that you have for us now and into eternity. And what you have made is good and where you are taking the world is good, Jesus. This is uh, Revelations 21, <clears throat> the beginning of it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I pray that you would help this picture of reality settle deep into our hearts. This picture of heaven coming to earth, of every tear and every pain being wiped away. God, that your kingdom will come and your will be, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, when we feel tempted to lose hope and to despair about like our predicament, would you help us remember this glorious future that you have for us, Jesus? Yeah, that our love is not wasted, that the good things that we do in this life are not wasted. And Jesus, I pray that you uh, would help us to do some of this good work with you now, to experience a foretaste of this beautiful promise and to make it visible for others. Like, thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to wait, that we can see some of, some of this future now, Jesus. Like, we can partner with you and love your people and love the things you care about and we get to see like snapshots glimpses of, of like, this beautiful future and so i pray that you would help us to say yes to that jesus to partnering with you May we be people that can offer this good hope to other people, Jesus. Like, this is compelling. If there's anything that you want to say to people, any word or picture, I pray that you would do that now, Jesus. there's something that we're struggling with right now, either physically or mentally, emotionally, I pray that we, uh, yeah, that you would, you would come, and Jesus, how, what do you want to 
say to that that place that place in our in our body in our life is there some um like hope that you want to give us about that thing that feels hard Yeah, I feel like God wants to say to some people, like, I want to come and do your work with you. Yeah, I feel like God is inviting me to love my body. So we thank you and we love you. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. You are good. Yeah, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. I want to do your joke. <laughs> what was my joke? Do you remember? It was about, it's like this. Well, I'm going to do it. Uh, go for it. I should do announcements, right? <laughs> yeah, do your announcements.